Terrific. So, you know, I just echo, I mean, so many of you in the audience are people I've read and looked up to and, and tried to emulate. So it's terrific to be able to be here, to be presenting. And I sure wish I was pa presenting on patient reported outcomes because that feels far more successful <laughs> than my efforts to actually implement precision medicine and routine clinical care. Um, and, you know, in, in Missouri, uh, you know, we're the show me state, right? I mean, all of this talk about what would be nice to have and what do we need to have and how should we go about doing it and can we tweak the models better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is irrelevant if it doesn't ultimately make, you know, patients feel better and improve the value of the health care that we deliver. And, and along those lines, uh, I want to share my disclosures, which is that, you know, naively, uh, I, I went all in on this because we were so enamored with, you know, Rod and David's writing and the power of this to work and some of our work that we actually spun off a company to implement risk models in routine clinical care. And so uh, I, I'm, you know, uh, unfortunately, the company's done very poorly, so I'm not nearly as financially <laughs> conflicted as I would like to be, but I, I'm very emotionally conflicted with this. And... My, my goals are, are to talk just briefly about moving from model building to implementation and then really delve a little deeper on uh, implementing a decision aid in routine clinical practice, uh, something more targeting physicians, uh, talk about the physician barriers that we need to start considering if we want any of our work to have any impact then get into a shared decision-making tool and how we need to think about the infrastructure needed to do that and just end with a few concluding thoughts. So much about what's happening in precision medicine is all about how do you separate a population into those patients who do well in green or do poorly in red. And, you know, whether you're discovering sort of the new, you know, genetics or the pharmacogenomic interactions or some new biomarker imaging technique or using clinical risk models, um, you know, almost all the funding and evidence is on this sort of knowledge generation side of the equation. What essentially nobody is spending any money or research doing is figuring out how do we move that knowledge into routine clinical care so that we can start to use it every day on patients to help improve the value of care that we deliver. And so I'm going to describe some of our experience in trying to take that second step. And the idea really came from, there's not a lot of heterogeneity in this model. This is more about absolute risk differences and benefits as a function of risk. And, you know, we said, well, look, in cardiology, we have the National Cardiovascular Data Registry. It collects millions of records a year on patients undergoing cardiac procedures, and it builds risk models. And it gives every quarter, each site, what the observed over expected rate for a series of complications could be. And for... 20 years ago, this was sort of state-of-the-art quality assessment through benchmarking. And what the college was never really interested in doing was taking those same risk models and using them prospectively at the time of medical decision-making to tailor treatment to risk to improve outcomes. And so we built this IT platform originally from a Doris Duke Clinic Clinical Innovation Award and ultimately became this e-PRISM thing that we unsuccessfully launched as a company to try and improve the value of healthcare with precision medicine. And, you know, the idea was to take the exact risk models that the NCVR was using to risk adjust the performance at hospitals and enter them with patient-specific data and create clinically useful tools that could be part of clinical care that could allow the heterogeneity of benefit for individual patients to be appreciated at the time you're making the decision and treating the patient. And so we said, well, look, you can't get into the cath lab, because I'm a cardiologist, we talk about angioplasty a lot, without signing informed consent. And our informed consent documents are unequivocally terrible. They're, they're, they're you know, written at a postgraduate level in this language called legalese, and they don't accomplish any of the things that we really want them to do by informing patients or providers. And you know they're terrible because this was our old consent form. You just ripped off the sheet of paper, and you reused the exact same form if you're doing an angioplasty or if you're doing a skin biopsy or if you're doing a liver transplant. Right? It's the same form. You just sort of you know, do that in. And we said, well, you know, if you want to make a risk model part of routine clinical care, you've got to implement it into routine clinical care so nobody can get through the process of being treated without getting that risk model run. 
And so we replaced the consent form with a personalized consent form generated for each and every patient. And yes, we you know, made it more readable at the eighth grade level than the 18th grade level. We put pictures about what's an angioplasty, what's a stent. But importantly, we embedded into the consent form each patient's individualized risk of bleeding or dying as a function of their personal characteristics or to support shared decision making, what's the likelihood you're going to come back in a year if you get a bare metal or drug eluting stent? Because that has implications for patients since you know, the drug eluting stent requires a much longer period of aggressive antiplatelet therapy, which leads to bleeding, bruising, can cause delays in elective procedures, et cetera. And, uh, uh, but it does make you mean you'll come back less. So you have the benefit of not coming back as often for repeat procedure against the hassles of another medicine and the bleeding and bruising, et cetera. And so we, you know, and, and to further implement this in routine clinical care, and this is what we do now, we didn't do it in a study I'm about to share with you, we actually say, okay, doctors will get the consent form, they'll go, they'll answer a few pages, they'll finish a medical record, they won't even remember what the risks were. So in the cath lab during the time out, on the cath lab monitor, is that patient's risk. You know, in this case, a bleeding risk of 7.5%. And our cath lab has a protocol, and it lights up in the protocol, give this patient a, uh, uh, you know, a radial approach and bivalirutin as your anticoagulant. So it's in workflow, so you can do it. This is the patient's risk of acute kidney injury, and this is how much contrast I have to work with to try and get the heterogeneity or the tailoring treatment to risk in the flow, not only at the time of the consent, but literally as you're about to touch the patient, you know what their risks are and what everybody in the cath lab thinks is gonna be the way we're gonna approach it. And so we tested this in a, a, a nine center study. Just know that these are very good centers. There's Kaiser, there's Mayo, there's Yale, there's Baylor, and you know, we published this with great enjoyment, which is that we showed that before the doctors knew the risk of patients, this is the patient's uh, predicted risk of bleeding, the observed rate of bleeding. When the doctors did not know the patient's risk of bleeding because the risk model had not been done, this is the uh, observed bleeding as a function of predicted risk. Uh, when the doctors knew it was much lower, there was an a actually, and, and if you were tailoring treatment to risk, you would expect the greatest benefit to be in the highest risk patients, which is exactly what we observed. And in a fully adjusted model, there was a 45% reduction in bleeding when the doctors knew the risk of their patient before they approached them. All right. That's great, right? I mean, here you've got a, a great opportunity to you know, do the whole value thing, improve patient experience with the consent form, uh, improve outcomes by tailoring treatment to risk, and lowering costs by not using these expensive anticoagulants like bivalirudin in very low-risk patients who don't benefit. And then we started to realize some of the barriers in implementing precision medicine. And I want to take you a little under the hood of that fancy curve. So, we had nine hospitals participating in this study and 137 different interventional cardiologists. These are great interventional cardiologists. And they treated about 7,500 patients before we ever implemented a risk model. And if they were practicing good medicine, if they intuitively knew the risk of the patient, you would expect them to use bleeding avoidance strategies, you know, a radio approach, a bival, a closure devices, ways we try and reduce bleeding in the higher risk patients. So as the risk of bleeding goes up, they should start using at least one bleeding avoidance strategy. And there are three to choose from, right? So, you know, maybe at the low end it doesn't matter, but this is the shape of curve you'd expect each doctor to practice given the, the risk of the patients they treated. This is the scariest research slide I've ever generated in my career. This is the actual practice patterns of 137 uh, excellent interventional cardiologists at great institutions across the country. <laughs> and, and what should be just astonishing to you is that it's all over the map. Some doctors are always using bleeding avoidance strategies regardless of risk. That's okay, maybe they're emphasizing safety. But some doctors are never using them regardless of the patient's risk of bleeding. That makes no sense. And the vast majority of patients, of doctors, are treating the lower risk patients more than the higher risk patients, which is completely counterintuitive. And you know, to, you know, if you needed an angioplasty, you had a 10% risk of bleeding, and you went to one of these excellent centers, the person who does your procedure is a random event, who's ever assigned to the lab that day. 
you wouldn't want to get a bleeding avoidance strategy. You wouldn't want to get probably at least two. And yet your chance of getting any ranges from one to 100%. That's a problem. And so we need to be thinking about these physician barriers. And so you've seen this red, green, yellow slide about patients before, right? I mean, you know, some do well, some do poorly. We risk stratify. Now they're all wearing stethoscopes. These are doctors. Some doctors, you're going to give them a risk model, and they're going to improve their performance. And some doctors are going to say, to hell with you with telling me how to practice medicine. And they're going to do the exact opposite of what you and your protocol recommends. <laughs> and so they're going to be in red. And so we actually looked at it in this study. And, and this is important because it shows that changing your behavior can improve your outcomes. And what we did is we plotted every doctor, the, the dark dots are just doctors with more um, uh, numbers that we have more confidence in their estimates, the light doctors are. But this is all 137 doctors. This is the change in bivalirudin. So this is a expensive alternative to heparin to minimize bleeding in the high-risk patients. And so what you would like to see is that doctors are above one. They've increased their use of bivalirudin in high-risk patients when they know the risk of that patient for bleeding and that it's high. And so they're emphasizing safety. Doctors who are below this horizontal line, they're using less bivalirudin in the patients who most benefit. And the only way I could say that is they're de-emphasizing safety. I don't know a nice way to put it. This is the use in low-risk patients, right? So if you're using less bivalirudin in low-risk patients, you're being sensitive to costs. You're emphasizing costs. And if you're using more bivalirudin in low-risk patients, you're de-emphasizing costs. And what we found across these 137 doctors is that um, about 43% of them were in this quadrant. They're just using more of this expensive anticoagulant overall. About a third, 36%, were doing exactly what would you hope. They're doing more in the high risk, less than the low risk. So this is very cost-effective way of delivering care. Some people are just using less overall. That was about uh, 15%. And 8% did the exact opposite of what we would have hoped. The patients who benefit most got less of the therapy. Those who benefit at least got more of the therapy. And the bleeding reduction in those who uh, were in the upper two quadrants, and this was highly statistically significant, was uh, a 52% reduction in bleeding. Those who used, uh, who just sort of used less overall, they had a 4% reduction in bleeding, uh, but the rest of the country reduced uh, by 12% over this time period. So they did a third as well as the rest of the country. And um, the people who did the exact opposite had an increase in bleeding. Now, these last two quadrants are too few doctors, too few events. They're not stable estimates. But the point is that if physicians alter their behavior and adhere to the risk models, you can improve the outcomes and the value of healthcare. I, I strongly believe. And so why don't doctors do it? So we actually did a qualitative research in this study. And we asked uh, 27 of the interventionalists from eight of the centers. And there were three themes, this theme of sort of experience versus evidence, rationing of care and perceived value. And the experience versus evidence concept was doctors saying things like, I think this has more to do with ego. Some physicians think that they've been doing this for years and years and years, and they don't need someone else's tool to help them explain to the patient what they think is important. That was a doctor with 24 years of experience in the cath lab. Uh, someone else said, I would say the practice habits and biases and stubbornness in cardiology is the biggest obstacle. Um, you know, and so can we think about, as we're trying to, to, to re-engineer the way we use these models, a way for physicians not to think that this is supplanting their clinical experience and judgment, but it's supplemental to it. And in our framing, that's going to be very, very important. You know, omission of therapy or rationing, this is, uh, you know, uh, a comment. At the end of the day, you want to do the best thing you can for each and every patient, not just the high-risk patients. Um, Restenosis is never higher with a drug limiting stent, never. So why wouldn't you put the Cadillac in everybody? Um, and, you know, this is the hardest thing for me to argue, spending a lot of money on somebody who's not going to benefit much when you're talking to clinicians who are really trying to do the best for every patient. But when you saw the variation in practice and not treating patients who benefit a lot, that seems 
inexcusable to me. And so crafting an argument around this seems important to me. And then the feeling that I just don't need this because I, I sort of know it all. I don't need these data to tell me what I already know. I already know this. Uh, the typical phrase you hear from operators is that I already know that information. The information is already in my head. Why do I need that form to tell me what to do? I always try to minimize the bleeding risk, regardless of what the person's risk is up front in radial artery cases where appropriate. And to see a number spelled out doesn't really help me much in the terms of what I do. And, and I would just say that, you, you know, we wouldn't see that variability in care as a function of risk if they already knew this. And creating a way for people to embrace the support, I think, is very important. And so our group has sort of conceptualized, it's not quite Alcoholics Anonymous with a 12-step program, but a five-step program <laughs> where you identify a clinical champion from within the lab who will drive it, you create a risk-based protocol, you implement this with a structured timeout in workflow, and I gave you a, a hint of that, and then there has to be feedback and accountability and some sharing of success. Because if the hospital is saving money, why not share some of that with the service line who's always fighting for capital budget? And here's just some examples. This is my hospital. We've been using the risk models for five years when the hospital bought the practice. And so in 2012, before the hospital bought the practice, you see that most doctors are treating high-risk patients more than low-risk, but there's a lot of variability across doctors. And so the hospital, and I'm not saying I had any role in setting this performance measure, set up a uh, fund where they would, if, if certain quality metrics were met, there would be a bonus payment. And so if these nine cardiologists would decrease their variability in their use of uh, bivalent as a function of risk, the hospital, uh, all 52 cardiologists in the practice would get about a sixth of that quality bonus because it was one of six metrics. And this is the 2013 data. And, uh, you know, our bleeding rate was a third of what was predicted. At Wash U, they implemented this, so they had an 8 to 10% bleeding rate. It went down to 2%. That's such a great reduction that every week one to two patients does not bleed in that cath lab that used to. And what happened is they implemented the model, and they got about a third of that reduction, or half of that reduction. But then they started literally putting a poster like in a, a scientific meeting in the cath lab with each doctor's name and the percent of time they deviated from the protocol, and you saw that other drop. <laughs> my, my last two slides I'm starting to run over is just about shared decision making. We have a PCORI grant, uh, had a PCORI grant that was fabulous in trying to engage patients in uh, deciding a drug looting or bare metal stent. I alluded to that. And so we worked with a lot of patients, what outcomes are important, how can we present this in an understandable way. And we created a personalized form for them about what the benefits are in black is coming back in a year with a bare metal or drug looting stent. And then the costs and the medicine, the risks and the medicines, et cetera. We then uh, had three phases of implementation. Usual care with the same consent you saw originally. That usual care supplemented with a decision aid and a decision coach, which is very important. And the decision aid printed out after the consent form without a decision coach. And the outcomes were, did the patient participate in the decision and did they have a stent preference? And what we found is that you know, when in green there was a decision aid with the coach, the doctor alone was much less likely to decide what kind of stent to have, and patients were much more engaged. They were also much more likely in green to have a preference of some type of stent. We didn't know which was right, just that they had a preference because the decision process had worked in giving them the information to have a preference. And what we found was that, you know, in comparing a coach to no coach, so all had the decision aid and the consent document, you know, the patients were ninefold more likely to uh, get all six knowledge questions correctly. They were tenfold more likely to talk with the nurse about their choices, 60% more likely to talk with the doctors. They were fourfold more likely to have a, a stent preference. The addition of the coach was very important in the shared decision-making tool being effective. And so I'm going to end by saying that models are meaningless without an effective implementation strategy. And while we can get published and we can get grants, we're not going to achieve our goals of actually improving the value of healthcare without figuring out how to integrate these in workflow. And I will just say that simpler models are much, much better than complex ones. Secondly, working with physicians and providers to think about how to actually get them to care is, some, uh, is a challenge not to be 
uh, uh, over, uh, underestimated. It is very, very challenging. Compelling evidence is important, but not sufficient. Proof of benefit is important, but not sufficient. And accountability incentives are absolutely critical. And I've talked to every hospital here about implementing this precision medicine tool. None of you are using it because of these kinds of barriers and wanting to actually you know, do it. And um, implementing shared decision making does require the, the infrastructure of delivering it with coaches and nurses and others, and it's not just giving a tool to doctors or giving a tool to patients. And so we need to be thinking about and incentivizing that. I'm sorry to go over, but thank you very much.